Welcome to the podcast, Andrew. Thank you, Leah. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you too. So good to have you on. So can you give us a little introduction of who you are and what you do? Sure. My name is Andrew Gibbons. Uh, I am a Feldenkrais teacher, and I'll explain that more in a minute. But basically, I have been for 20 years, uh, I've been in private practice as a Feldenkrais teacher. And I work with people uh, to help them improve the way that they live their lives. But it's mostly centered around how they move and how they pay attention to the way they move. So um, Feldenkrais really has, Feldenkrais is just the name of the person who invented the work. Um, and it doesn't explain anything. The word Feldenkrais doesn't really explain anything to, to anybody. But the two, the two practices that are really, uh, that comprise the work, one is called functional integration. And that's just the private one-on-one -on -one, uh, sessions you might have with a, with a teacher. Uh, it's hands-on usually, there's a table, there's bolsters and supports, et cetera. And then there's the other practice, which is called awareness through movement. And that's a literally a movement practice, but is really also um, tied to the way that you use your attention when you move. Um, and so those awareness through movement is often taught either in groups. It can be done by one person just with a recording or with a, a written uh, transcript of a lesson or something like this. But those are the two, uh, those are the two sort of uh, applications uh, of the work. Um, and I've done this for 20 years. I was, a, I was a classical pianist in a past life, and my own injuries and difficulties and lack of technique or coordination or desire to, to, to sit better and not have pain and all those kinds of things, th that's what attracted me uh, to this work. And um, so what is Feldenkrais? It's a great question. I, I think it'd be best to sort of describe it as what does it do? Mm. Um, so if you can imagine, most people are going through life pretty much with no idea of how they move because it's not necessary. For the most part, when you were a baby, if, if things went more or less pretty well through your life, you learned to roll and to crawl and eat and talk and see and walk. And you, you learned all those things without having any sort of intellectual model. They just seem to grow out of your experience as a human being. And then, of course, you go on and you live your life. And, and most of those skills that you acquire, most of the movement skills that you acquire, they're usually just good enough. You learn them to the extent mm. that they're good enough. And this is a really interesting question is, what does that mean, good enough? Well, yes. most people are sitting, you and I are both sitting in a chair, and right now we're doing a good enough job. We, not, neither one of us has <laughs> you know, fallen, <laughs> fallen off our chairs. We, we, we haven't made that big of a mistake in our sitting yet, at least in this session. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, we just um, started. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and most of us are like this. Yeah, most of us are like this throughout our lives, that we, we walk along and maybe you trip on something and, and you stumble and, you, and you, you fall or you get back up. And you, for the most part, you just think, well, that was, that was a bad moment. I'm so glad I didn't break my arm. And, and you just continue <laughs> on. You don't, you don't necessarily investigate now you're, you're walking. You just think, oh, it happens to everybody. But of course, as, as we age, uh, some of these ideas about what's good enough and what's not so good, these ideas become more and more uh, important. And they start to press on our lives a lot more. Um, now, most of us learn what's good enough, right? Unless you're interested in athletics, for instance, or you pursue dance or performing arts where it's not about good enough. It's about really pursuing the upper, the upper tiers of dexterity or strength or balance. And then you really receive specific training to do that. If you want to go play soccer at a high level, you don't just come up with your own, eh, I think I'll try this. I mean, you know, great soccer players, of course, they do it in the and you get specific training for that sport. Um, and that's the way you get good. And you keep getting, you, you keep getting instruction, you keep and you see if your ideas are, are working out well or not. And that's pretty, not be that interested in being an athlete or we're just trying to be fit or we're just trying to stay healthy. Um, 
even there, people are not necessarily They just mm -hmm. want to apply the things that they either see or they, they could also get training from a fitness coach or, or whatever. They just want to apply do it this many times a week. And there's kind of a formula to the way you approach that activity. Usually what happens is though, that most of us become interested in the quality of our movement under particular circumstances. Usually it's an injury. Yes, it's an injury or it's a pain. Or it's 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 persistent pain that is draining away the quality of your life, or making making it hard for you to live your life the way you were just the week before. And pain is an incredibly persistent teacher. And if you ignore it, it usually tends to get worse. And for most people, that's the experience. That's the that's the kind of life event that really gets our attention. And then we have to go and work with maybe a physician or a physical therapist. And, and those are the moments where we start to encounter, oh, you mean the way I've been sitting is contributing to my back pain or the way I've been moving my hand over the piano is causing my shoulder issue or whatever. That's where it gets very interesting because the way you move and the way you actually attend and pay attention to the way you move, those things are woven together to create what eventually become injuries. But nobody may really talk to you about that until after you've had the experience. And then it can become a way, that kind of training can become a way of digging yourself out of a, a hole that you've gotten into. And so most people are very familiar with um, injury prevention. Everybody wants prevention. Everybody wants to avoid the bad things, of course. Um, and, and everybody's you know, familiar with the word rehabilitation, where you you injure your ankle and then you go work with a physical therapist and you get stretches or you get strengthening exercises and hopefully you improve. And the idea is just to get rid of the pain and to strengthen the muscles that are weak, et cetera. And you get back to functioning the way you did before. And um, Feldenkrais kind of sits in a, in a similar category, but the approach is quite, it's quite different. So, mm -hmm. And we can talk about that if we want. Yes. Uh, so what, what is the Feldenkrais approach? Well, the approach, it, it really has to do with the way that a, it creates a situation. It creates a very special situation where a person's attention is turned on to themselves in the context of moving so that you actually have a much more specific set of experiences a more specific set of principles or, or guideposts in the experience of moving. And you use this, you, you, the, the Feldenkrais method sort of creates this context and holds the context for you so that you stay within the boundaries of what we would call learning, where you're really exhibiting learning behavior and not kind of performance behavior. Now, most people will say like, what do you mean learning yes. behavior? What do you mean performance behavior? So performance behavior, generally speaking, is the one where a person is, is they're trying to put forth as much effort as they can, right? If you and I were on the same soccer team, we're trying to win the championship, right? You, I pass you the ball, you've got a shot on goal. Leia, take it, take the shot, kick it. You know, I don't care if you're out of breath. I don't care if your leg is kind of sore. I don't care if you ran all the way down the field and you're about to fall over, you're so tired. Leia, take the shot. We could win the game, right? That's yeah. a situation where we are, you and I are trying to perform to a certain standard in order to achieve some, some goal, some, you know, score the point and, and win the game. And in general, when you're in a performance context, your own personal subjective experience or your way of monitoring how am I doing, it's very externalized. How are we doing? Well, look at the scoreboard, Leia. That's how we're doing. We're two points down and there's four minutes left in the game. That's how we're doing, right? Are you scared? I don't care. We got to get back out there. We got to, you know, it's not about, um, it's not about some soft, deep intuition at that moment. It's about performing to the standard and hopefully winning. That's very, very different from a learning context. Mm -hmm. Now, in a learning context, you remove all the externals, maybe not all, but you, you remove a lot of those external standards 
so that you can actually improve your skill, your your way of interacting with the the ball or the game. I mean, even soccer teams, when they practice, they don't just practice by, okay, let's let's break up into two teams and let's see who wins. I mean, there is that part of that part of yeah. practice is to scrimmage and you know have these kinds of games. But also you might practice by just juggling the ball with your feet, right? You know, soccer players, they, they bounce the ball and they use their head and they do all kinds of skill drills. But it's not about, uh, did you get to 50 yet? Or did you do it in, in, an, in this many seconds instead of that many seconds? It's really kind of an open-ended practice where the, the person is more, much more interested in refinement, mm. not in performance. And in that kind of situation, one of the things that's so important if you're interested in refinement is you're interested in mistakes. In a performance environment, you better not make mistakes. You're going to get penalized. The other team is going to take advantage of your mistake or the other player or whatever it is. A performance environment, mistakes are bad. They are what, they're what define the loss of the game instead of the, the win. But in right. a learning environment, you're actually interested in the mistakes because the mistakes they really reveal usually a, a, a gap or a difference or a, a contrast between where you thought your knee was when you were juggling the ball and where the ball actually was. Like you, you miscalculated. And that's a very useful thing when you're refining because you're trying to see what, what is it about the way that I'm orienting towards, the, towards my leg or towards the ball if I'm a soccer player. What, what is it about my own internal experience that I don't quite understand or that I keep ignoring, hoping that things will go well? In a, in a learning context, there's a situation where you can actually address that. Yeah. So in the Feldenkrais method, we're interested in creating that learning context and really creating um, a very rigorous, Mm -hmm. but also very gentle, a very safe context in which the person's attention can take in these various details, but also make it useful to them, right? Okay. Yeah. So in, in a lot of situations where a person is practicing, I don't know, do you play a musical instrument or did you ever play a musical I, instrument? I used to. I used to, I mean, I still play, but I, I don't, I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't have my, my fantasies that I used to have about <laughs> being a professional, but the, um, you know, very often for musicians, when you're practicing, you're slowing the music down. You're playing at a much yeah. slower tempo. Why? Well, if you're going to perform it, shouldn't you just always play it at the tempo that it's going to be? Well, that, that creates a problem. It's very hard to be in the space where you can learn where you can actually pay attention to, you know, which finger is hitting the right key and all this sort of thing. It's hard to do that if you're, if you're trying to play faster than you know how. And so this, there's a wisdom in being able to scale everything down and create a, a context where your skill, where it is at this particular time, is really well matched by the, the pace that you're trying to memorize or play at or whatever it might be. And there's a real art to that. There's a real art to creating uh, a very safe, specific and clear context for what you're doing. And that's, you could say that's the art of the Feldenkrais method is to really hold that context very clearly for people. Interesting. So how did you get interested in learning about this? learning how to learn like this nuance thing <laughs> well I, I i'll tell you it wasn't very nuanced when i first when i first discovered it. first of all i was like anybody else i had no idea what it was it wasn't like i was thinking to myself i need a a rather nuanced way to refine my abilities and <laughs> the conversation going on in my in my head i was i was very young i was about 16 when i first encountered it yeah, I usually away, not the thoughts that go through a 16 year old. Say again, not, yeah, not a lot of 16 <laughs> Yeah, probably not the thoughts that are going through a 16 year old boy. I'll, I'll tell you, I was, in, I was in a context when I was 16, I was away from home at a summer music festival. I was, I was in this piano program for, for mm -hmm. talented musicians. And what I found was I was, I was very lucky to be there because I did not see myself really as anywhere near 
the level of the people that were around me. Um, but I had a great time. I really enjoyed the experience and it opened up the whole world of classical music and other kids who were doing this kind of stuff. I had no idea this world existed. But a friend of mine who was a singer, uh, and we're still friends today, he, he on, on his way somewhere, he was part of the singing program. He said, you know, there's this posture workshop that all the singers are going to. Do you want to come? And I said, it's a posture workshop. And he was like, yeah, yeah, you know, like you got to stand better to perform better. And, and everybody hears these ideas and goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I should, I should stand better. Yes, of course I should. <laughs> but you don't really have – what you have is a notion of, oh, th yeah, that, that would be good for me. But you don't really understand what it's, what it's about. Yeah. And I went, and lucky enough for me, I found it very interesting because one thing I was very well acquainted with was how badly I seemed to coordinate my body at the piano. I did not feel, you know, fluid and virtuosic. I felt quite twisted up when I played. Really? And so I was motivated. <laughs> and, and I had a really good experience in the workshop because the teacher was very, used very clear language and very simple questions. It was not a very, um, it was not a fuzzy situation. It was a very experimental and exploratory context. Mm. And I had not been in one of those before. I had had piano lessons where the teacher would say, you know, no, no, you got to make yeah. your head like this. Especially the, the classical world, right? It's very like drilling, lots of like, well, discipline, but like, that's all not good enough. Try harder, try harder, try harder. <laughs> Yeah, your only way out apparently is more effort, right? Very, yes. There's very little conversation about how to modulate your effort or refine your effort. Um, and so that workshop really got my attention, not only because of that kind of language. And it was, I think it was about a, it was probably about three hours. It was like an afternoon workshop. <laughs> and we did a couple of awareness through movement lessons as a group. And I was miserable in them. I was physically just like, oh my, I had to sit with my legs to the side and I had this hip cramp. And I, you know, I used to be athletic, but then I played the piano and everything just went out the window. And, um, but I still, what I found inside the practice was it was very practical. She would ask these mm -hmm. questions. Can you feel the difference between when you're, when your head turns at the same time as your arm does versus when you're, when your head is, is kept still while you move the arm, does the arm feel any different? To mm -hmm. me, those were very basic, very practical questions. They didn't tell me how to play the piano. It's, it wasn't a, it's sort of like a, you know, here's how you, here's great piano technique, do this. It wasn't like that. It was not top down at all. It was very much the reverse. It was very much a, um, what they call an inductive experience. You know, the mm -hmm. difference between deductive and inductive. Oh, please explain. So most kinds of instruction, if you go for mm -hmm. tennis lessons, you never played mm -hmm. tennis before, you're going to get a lot of instruction on how to hold the racket, how to mm -hmm. swing the racket, where to hit the ball, what's inside the bounds, what you're going to learn the rules, right? Okay. And this approach is very top down. It's very deductive. You're given, you're given these things. And as long as these things are true, and you can do them, apparently that's the direction of improvement for the tennis player. Of course, that's just one approach. Um, an inductive approach is very different because you're actually paying attention to your subjective experience at the very beginning and you're building out from there, right? You're kind mm -hmm. of, you're following the smell. What do I, let's go over here. Let's see what's over here. And you're, you're gradually acquiring new information but it's, it's, it's usually on a slower time scale, and it usually emphasizes much more your particular point of view in the experience rather than in the top-down, in the deductive way. It's like, look, here are the rules of great chess. If you can do this, you'll win at chess. And what happens immediately when you do that is you think, okay, I, I, I got to you know, forget me. I've got I've to do all these things. And you don't let necessarily learn how to ask your own questions in a, in a deductive experience. And so I really, it's not like anybody even explained this to me when I was, it, this, this was not a part of the conversation. It, I, what, what I just noticed was, wow, moving very slowly, I can really pay attention well to these details that the teacher is, is offering us. 
that's really quite like, do I notice this? Yeah, I notice this. This is actually quite clear to me. I mean, I, I, I wasn't a good musician, but I was a musician used to paying attention to lots of you know information and details going by. Mm -hmm. So when you're in a very slow and gentle context, it actually makes it easier for you to both notice these things and make use of them for yourself. Um, the other thing that was really interesting about that experience was that the teacher also worked with musicians at their instruments. She did kind of like a, like a master class mm -hmm. and the teacher was not a musician. And that, that really got my attention because oh. most piano lessons, of course, you're working with a, with a pianist and you have all kinds of questions about piano and there's, there's the certain traditions that you're learning and certain technical things that you're learning. But here was a situation where the teacher was not a musician and the teacher was working with a pianist at the piano in a way that I have never seen a piano teacher work with a pianist in that she was really working with her physical relationship with the instrument, but not in the traditional container. Um, and the result was a little stupefying, to be honest. Um, yeah. the, the, it was a friend of mine that she worked with and after mm -hmm. a summer together, you really know, you know what each other sounds like, you know what your Beethoven sonata sounds like, you know what my little Debussy arabesque sounds like. And the, the change that took place inside of 20 minutes was like, what? Like it, it the piece went from being kind of a tense, uh, mess to being mm -hmm. artistic. Wow. And that was that I didn't know what that was, but that definitely got my attention. Right. As, as an insecure musician, I was definitely like, <laughs> I'm going, I'm going to be looking up a little bit more about this. My dad was a writer. I, I, I went to the bookstore and I asked them for a book about Feldenkrais. That was my little, that was my next step. So. Wow. Really cool. Yeah. Um, so mm, can you talk a little bit about, so for example, somebody starts with Feldenkrais. What is like the internal development that happens when learning and applying the practice? Well, I think, I think it's important for, for people to realize that it, it's important for the person to at least be curious about what they want to improve. Um, okay. yeah, it's, it's good if you, I mean, of course there are people out there that I think just maybe interested in the practice itself. Like that just sounds interesting to me. I think I'll just mm -hmm. learn more about that. And that's of course nice too. But most people that get interested are actually coming for a reason. They're coming because they've been injured and they've been through a cycle of different kinds of help that may have helped, but they're still dealing with some of the issues and they, they want to understand what this practice may have to offer that the other practices didn't. Um, and so that's just useful that the person is, it knows, why they're coming. It's not just some broad general interest in Feldenkrais. Mm, okay. Nothing wrong with being interested in, in Feldenkrais either. It's just that um, there's a way in which practitioners, there, there is no lesson one for every person. You can start from anywhere. If a person has hand issue that we can start right with the way the hand and the shoulder are interacting or the way the spine and the shoulder interact with the hand. I mean, there's a lot of uh, vocabulary and creative uh, uh, possibilities that a good practitioner can bring. Um, but as far as your question, which is what is the internal sort of development process of the person? Mm -hmm. I'm going to generalize here. I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, 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 obviously <laughs> it's, it's, it is all different. I think in the beginning for most people, part of what they're learning is simply how to pay attention. Well, mm. um, and, and a lot of people are not familiar with with doing this. Some people are very familiar. Musicians, for example, it's not that musicians are easy to work with. It's just that musicians in, in general, they've had a lot of experience paying close attention to something. And when their attention is simply turned to their own body without the violin in their hands, they still have things to learn, but they're familiar with paying attention to the movement mm -hmm. of their arm through space, right? Or their, the, move, the combination of the head and the arm or whatever the, whatever the lesson is maybe built around. So in the beginning, the person is really learning to become uh, familiar or, or to certainly engage with how they pay attention to themselves in, in, if it's an awareness to movement lesson in that context, 
even if it's a one-on-one -on -one lesson with a teacher where it's hands-on, the teacher's use of touch and the position that they are and the certain kinds of movements that they make, the emphasis within that will include how that person on the table is taking in the information of the touch. It's not just about the practitioner has some useful technique and you apply this technique to this kind of injury and that doesn't usually go very well. And there's lots of other disciplines where that is the model, where it's, it's all about the technique. Here, mm -hmm. it's, imagine if you were a music teacher and you were teaching a, a young student on how to play the, the flute or whatever it was, it, it can't just be you telling them what to do and them just trying desperately to do it. That's what a lot of situations turn into. A lot of instructional situations end up in that place over yeah. and over and over again. So, um, but there, the, at some point there has to be the recognition that there is a person in there who mm -hmm. may have questions of their own. And there may be certain gaps just because you ask them to move the arm like this and they do kind of move the arm like that. It doesn't mean that they necessarily feel everything there is to feel about the way this movement is being created. And this is where Feldenkrais right. is really quite interesting because it takes, it takes as its starting point the idea that moving without paying attention is something you already know how to do. <laughs> you you <Yes>. already <laughs> walk from your house to the car and you're thinking about three or four other things. You're lost in thought about <laughs> something else. And you get to the car and you turn it on and you drive away. But it's, it's not as if you're paying close attention to like, here I go, I'm walking towards the car like this. Um, yeah. But the thing is, movement as a context Mm -hmm. Movement is an incredibly, it's, it's incredibly easy to change certain elements of movement, but simply by paying attention to them. And I mean, change the, the okay. quality, the, the smoothness or the, the, uh, the ease or the comfort by learning how to pay attention. You know, the act of moving really is, it's coordination. You're moving more than one thing at the same mm. time. And learning to do this, learning to actually pay attention that when I turn my head, for instance, there's, of course, a way to do it where I turn my head like this. Watch. You can see my fingers. They, my fingers mm -hmm. don't move. This is just a movement of my a few vertebrae in my neck. Right. And this yes. is legal. This is legal to do. There's no there's no <laughs> certain way to, to move. But there's also a way to turn where actually my chest and my shoulder, I turn from much deeper down in my spine. Mm -hmm. Now. It's, it's not a miracle. People are doing this all day long. The question is, are they ever in a situation where they learn how to value that ability and to see it very, very clearly and to begin to bring it into the foreground of how they actually sense themselves in action, right? It's mm -hmm. not that people are walking around and moving so badly that they're just, you know, they're bumping into trees and falling on the ground every every th third step. They are doing kind of what's what's good enough. But if you really are interested in leveling up your coordination, the the pleasure you take in movement, the the quality of support that you get from your legs and your pelvis and your feet from the ground, how connected you are. These things of course take a little time, but the point is to learn how to use the time in the practice very well. And Feldenkrais really sets up this situation where your attention and your ability to, to enjoy assembling your experience a little differently, this is what makes it quite attractive because people don't realize that you, you can do this. You can, you can be in a situation that's not athletic, that's not ballistic and uh, just putting forth all kinds of uh, the, the more exercise mode of things, which is very mm -hmm. important. Um, but you can be in this very slow, almost contemplative quality with yourself, and yet it can be very, very practical and clear, like a, a sort of a step-by-step -step process by which you build skill back into your life. You build some sensitivity mm. back into your life. You, ac you can actually build compassion for yourself back into your life. Yeah. It's very hard to build compassion back into your life if, yeah. if your only context for paying attention to yourself is in this kind of performance context. You know, I'm no athlete, but going to the gym and just, you know, working hard and sweating, that's great. That's a very different uh, environment for paying attention to yourself than, than something like this. Right? It sounds like... Um there's a possibility of going from let's say strain and effort 
to ease. Yes. Is that correct? And I then... would say that is that is certainly one of the very practical goals of the work is to teach a person how to actually go from having an experience of themselves, which is just it's it's all strain, it's all stiffness, it's all just moving according to being expedient. You've just got to get this thing done, right? To going from mm -hmm. that to to really learning how to coordinate yourself in a way that actually has pleasure, even joy, even smoothness or equanimity or these kinds of uh, aesthetic qualities, these things are trainable. Now, most people associate those ideas with maybe practices like yoga or Tai Chi or Qigong mm -hmm. or other things like this, and you can definitely acquire them in those practices. Feldenkrais is definitely in the same, I would say, in the same category in that it's a, it's typically a softer kind of practice, a softer kind of movement practice. But the whole idea is to really begin to understand what what is strain built out of? What 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 makes strain? Oh, strain is actually that's interesting. By... Yeah, it's very interesting. So, I mean, as a, as a musician, well... that's all I really cared about. I was just like, I live in a very strained stiff body. It's not yeah. helping. I know I'm I'm willing to make as much effort as you tell me to make. But I can also feel that this is not working really well for me because I, I had a I had quite a bad injury and pain in my hand. Um, so it's it, Feldenkrais is very much for the person that that really does think there, there's got to be a better way, right? There, there <laughs> and there totally is a better way. It, it takes time and it takes some smarts to figure out how to use this kind of context to your advantage. But you're you know, pain, your body is not lying to you when you when you're experiencing, you know, physical pain when you make a movement. That is your That's body. That's a hard one to kind swallow, of just, right? <laughs> you know, you may not be harming the tissue. It may not be that bad, but it's definitely telling you that whatever you're doing, it has the potential for things to not go so well if you add even more force to this. And with a lot of people, they're just not very curious. They, they're just, they True. just kind of get through it and then they eventually it gets the better of them unfortunately so what did you discover is, strain is made out of like what what does does it need to keep get the body like really stiff yeah I'll, ugly. I'll try to very generally <laughs> and I'll, I'll try to get more specific yeah again the, the first thing strain is built out of is ignorance mm, okay you just don't know what you're doing and not on any not on any useful level. You, you have some version of how to sit. Mm -hmm. Again, here we are successfully. We still have not fallen out of our chairs. Apparently, no. we are successful sitters, right? Kind um, of, yeah. <laughs> so you, you have some version that is, that is enabling you to sit more or less successfully. But you, you don't really understand enough about how, let's say, sitting is actually comprised. What are you sitting on? The the bones at the bottom of your pelvis are there bones? Of the, is it just a flesh, fleshy muscles at the bottom of your your butt, or is there are there bones? Is there is there part of the structure there? Do you know that the shape? Are, is there one place that you are there? Are there two? Are there three? You know, this is where the ignorance is really like people go, what? That you you mean there are bones? And yeah, you're sitting on the bones, and then you can use <laughs> certain kinds of lessons, or you can even illustrate with the skeleton and. Again, it's, it's an educational process, too. And just like anything else that you do, it is improved by removing ignorance. Because as you know more, you, you not, it's not just that you, you, you're accumulating facts in your head. You're actually applying them to how mm. you sit every time. You're trying to actually build a better model of what you're doing when you sit, for instance, or if you're walking as of your interest or whatever. And um, it, it turns out that it's actually a lot more fun to move efficiently. It's more pleasant. Mm, you, you actually remove a lot pleasant, of the, yes. the, the, the difficulties or the, the strain that you, you've lived with for a long time. In fact, you could even say that you've learned to rely on the strain and on the discomfort. These things get woven into your, your identity or your character, and you think it's just you. But in fact, it's a problem that you don't understand very well. And you need, you need training. You, there, there is training available. That's what we provide. There is training available to help you just untie that particular knot of ignorance. And in general, it's just ignorance and a lack of practice. 
once you understand, oh, I'm trying to remove some ignorance and understand this better, and you, you tether that to a kind of a consistent practice, you know, things tend to get better. Your body likes it when things feel better. You, you will tend to become motivated more when you realize I can stand like this. I can walk with this quality in my knee and not that awful garbage I was carrying around with me from this old ice skating injury that I never really cleared up. You know, that's, well, that's a satisfying uh, growth process too for a person. You know? I remember the, the time when I first like was introduced to Valley Cries and also did your lessons. And in a way, it's really humbling, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of embarrassing for you. You learn these skills over again? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're not, what you're learning is not flashy. You're not like, hey, everybody, let's no. learn, you know, a pirouette like in ballet. It, it's, you're, you're really, you're learning very foundational basics. Yeah. Which, yeah. Is, which is what you need, too. And I remember thinking, like, oh my God, where have I come to? I need to learn how to. How to roll. <laughs> yeah, to roll, to sit again, to stand properly. Yeah, but Maybe I'm still. But... I think that's very true. That's very true. <laughs> but just to make everybody feel a little bit better, right? Like, yeah. if you, uh, if somebody pursues uh, meditation, right? Mm -hmm. Meditation is certainly a lot more in the popular conversation than it, it that, than it has ever been. And certainly there are, there are conversations about meditation that are religious or, or deeply spiritual that go back way back thousands of years. And there are texts and you can get all interested in that. Some people are just interested in the, what will it do for me? How will it help me stay mm. relaxed or stay more oriented in my day or whatever? You know, when you're meditating, if you're just doing the basic mindfulness meditation or, or paying attention to your breath or whatever, again, you're not doing fancy mental gymnastics. This is not, uh, oh, I'm going to enter a deep spiritual uh, practice where I'm immediately starting to do all sorts of complex things or fancy uh, ideas. That's really not what you're doing. You're, you're basically learning to observe clearly a particular layer of your experience. And you're basically learning how to inhibit, how to, how to stop the tendency that you have, which is to just be caught up in thought to, to think without knowing that you're thinking. And you do that for 15 or 20 minutes. You just, you just get good at just noticing there goes another thought and you return to the breath or whatever the technique is, but you're not doing anything fancy. You're doing something extraordinarily basic. And yet it can have this very powerful and nutritious effect on everything else. Feldenkrais is not so different in its model that where there are lessons for those of your audience that are interested in, there are more athletic and more ballistic and more complicated and definitely more challenging kinds of lessons. But the, in the beginning, the, the whole project is to enter very cleanly and simply the process by which you pay attention to your movement, not so you can choke it and get, get the right thing <laughs> out of it and or score the, it's not that kind of context. You're basically learning how to inhibit a lot of your your bad tendency, your worst tendencies, the, the way in which if you if you were to bring your shoulder up to your head, you just kind of stiffen your neck and you can't make a beautiful quality of movement in your shoulder, or the way you might turn your head and not involve your torso at all. That's a that's a habit that most people have, and so you're you're basically examining, exploring, and experimenting with with your habits without trying to force them like toothpaste through a tube where you've got to perform to this particular standard, but you're, you're much more kind of learning about them at a much more basic level. And the funny thing is, is that once you understand that, once you understand that it's about learning what not to do, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have to be about you're, you're doing jumping jacks or you're, you're doing chest presses with a high, it doesn't have to be. By learning to inhibit some of these bad habits, it opens up the cooperation and the, the functional relationships in the body in a way that's actually safe, in a way that's actually pleasant. And then you'll see it, it kind of spreads into the rest of your, your day. Now, it's different for different people, of course, and some people have a really big experience at first and, and other people are just there, it's gonna take them longer, of course. But um, it's, it's very similar to that sort of model of meditation where, a big part of the practice is learning how to inhibit 
certain uh, things that you do all the time, right? Um, and for, you know, the whole issue of posture and good, good organization in, in action, what bad posture is generally is a real, there's, a, there's some sort of a conflict. That bad posture is usually, it's described as sort of a, an, an externalization of an internal conflict, right? Mm -hmm. the, when a person learns how to stand really well, mm -hmm. nothing really stands out. No, nothing is working harder than anything else when you stand well. Um, when you yes. stand poorly, there there are ways of, you know, they, people use plumb lines or they put them against grass paper. And you can see how the person is contorted somehow. You can start to see how the weight above is organized over the base below. Now, this is a way of visually seeing what some of these things are. But again, the person doesn't feel it as a problem. They just rely on it all the time. Right. And mm -hmm. so by by being able to examine it in a very safe and pleasant context, it's much easier to make the incremental changes towards something that's better instead of trying to force yourself to make the change. This is, a, of course, a, a challenge for people, which is like once they start to understand what could be better, they, of course, want to go faster and they want to yeah. <laughs> they want to get there right away. And, you know, then um, they strain again and, it, and then they, they have to go yeah. back and uh, it's a cycle. That's, that's right. Yeah, there, there is a real, um, there's a real art to understanding how your, your attention, the way you literally, the way you sense yourself as you move and how well distributed your attention is and how you combine that with your, with your intention. Yeah, that's the, mm. that's the little plan that's coming up that, that's telling me it's time to turn my, my head this way. In a Feldenkrais lesson or in an awareness and movement lesson, you really get this wonderful opportunity to watch how your own intention to move, how it actually flowers, how it how it comes into being. And you learn that there are many more moments that you can interrupt it and actually influence it than you typically experience in your in your everyday world or, or in your in your habit. And that's that's about giving somebody some power in their own life, some, some control over their experience. And if it's done well and, and you, you have a nice experience with a good teacher, it's, it's a really nice experience to realize there are things I can let go of. I don't need to be doing these things. And you start to recognize part of your own experience of discomfort or pain. You start to recognize the certain elements that you are always, it's, it, that it's an action, that there's an action component to the discomfort. There, there are many elements that contribute to, to pain and discomfort, but to learn how to recognize some place in your back that you're always keeping tense or some place in your shoulder that you, you always make this movement to initiate the turning of the head and you never, you never make that movement. Again, it's just mm. a, um, it's like a building of a vocabulary that was never there. You're learning to, you're learning words you haven't used before. And you're also learning that the, the old way of expressing yourself, it's just, it's just what you knew then, but that now you have more choices in the process. So, when I listen to you, it sounds like it. This it feels like the same words or like the same concept that you're like explaining could just as well be applied to like the whole your whole life in general. Like yeah. it's. It's there, not there are many metaphorical, just about the movement. Yeah, there are many yeah. <laughs> metaphorical qualities to this, um, especially because I think Feldenkrais, as a as a movement practice, right? As mm -hmm. and we really are concerned and about we we really exploit the context of movement itself. You're not just sitting there doing nothing, right? You're not. It's not meditation where you're really you're supposed to be quite still and it's all about the the mental processes going on or not going on. We really do use movement. But because mm -hmm. it's done at this slower pace, that there are these strategies, that, you know, going slowly is really a strategy for improving the quality of the learning behavior that you can that you can engage with. Because it's done at a slower pace, and also because it's not attached to some performative act. In other words, mm -hmm. you're not in a class and everybody is, it's all about the ballet choreography that you're going to have to perform next Sunday. I don't care how slowly you go in ballet practice. 
if it's if it's tethered to the choreography and the performance, people are going to feel this attachment to an external uh, performance of the idea. With Feldenkrais, the the movements, the lessons, the patterns that are used in the lessons, they are kind of in a way they're kind of happily divorced from these these finished ideas out in life. It gives you a, a context in which it's okay to explore without necessarily needing a finished product right there in the lesson. And for a lot of people, this is a very, it's a very welcome, like, oh my God, it's just a relief that they're not having to like, you know, they're not in an exercise class where the, the teacher is able to be on the bike and just go like mad and they're in the back just, uh, uh, like it's a, it's a mismatch of, of pace for them. A lot of people are relieved at the, at the slow pace. Other people uh, okay. really struggle actually with the slow pace of it because they, they, if they're not, they're used to, man, I want this and that and, and the other. And it, it's hard for them to see like, how is this going to apply to this corner of my, of my life? And that's where having uh, a teacher that can really hold the conversation about the method well, that becomes very helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because there, there are little, there are, cultural gaps that people get stuck in and there are linguistic problems that people get stuck in and there are physical issues that really come up and everybody has this <laughs> most people have this they, they imagine that what they're supposed to have is kind of this uninterrupted success curve <laughs> that'd be <laughs> nice I, right by participating in this beautiful practice that you say has all these <laughs> wonderful qualities and will do all these things for me well, what I'm supposed to experience is just unmitigated success, right? And of course, that's not usually the experience either, because what you're what you're encountering in the lessons very often is yourself. You're you're encountering mm -hmm. your own habits in the lesson, and that is that is fairly confrontational for most people to some degree. Yes. Yeah. The people that understand that that's going to happen they're mm -hmm. usually, they're okay. They're actually accepting that that's part of what the practice is for. Uh, but other people, that's a kind of a, a shock and they don't like that shock too much, you know, especially if they're going very slowly. The imagine if I'm going slow, then everything's just going to be simple, right? Well, you'll see. <laughs> yeah. You're actually the first person I heard about saying that, like, you're going to encounter yourself at Fat Christ and that it's like, challenging i all the other teachers that i've encountered they weren't paying that much attention okay <laughs> well i mean there, there's different there's different teachers there's different styles mm. for, for sure yeah, yeah, yeah. different for teachers sure. bring to the method um i definitely think if you were to ask a bunch of my students like what what's Andrew like as a teacher? What's What kind of quality does he bring? It's not that I'm um, super intense, although I'm, I can be, you can probably tell by my, my demeanor, but um, what I'm, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with, certainly after, after 20 years of doing this full time and really trying to take the method apart as best I can and figure out what doesn't work in it, what what I think is mm -hmm. actually too vague or what what is really solid about the method, what is really open to interpretation, what are, you know, I, I think a responsible teacher does that. I don't think you just take the method, you know, saying it's all perfect and whatever you do and you call it Feldenkrais, it's going to be great. I, I don't believe that personally. But yeah. um Definitely, to me, what's important is that the people in the in the class or my my private clients, that over time they they are really learning how to how to pay attention with a certain quality and a certain rigor. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are times when that's not possible. There's times when people are sleepy. There are times when people are injured, and there's there's a variety of experiences, of course. But as the teacher who is, is sort of holding a particular, I'm holding my version of, of the way Feldman yeah, sure. thought, I'm going to try and tell you that you're here because you want something out of the practice, right? You, you don't just want to float along the river and just look up at the sky forever and ever and kind of think, well, I'm doing Feldenkrais because it's slow or I'm doing Feldenkrais because it's, it's soft or it, 
you you do want to consider what your goals are with with mm. doing this work. And uh, some people that conversation happens much later on. They first just have their early experiences and they find that it's safe and they like it. And so they pursue it that way. Um, but I think it's important to figure out what it is that you're looking for and, and to be willing to have that conversation many times with, with the teacher that you're working with, because we do want it to provide us with the benefits that are, that we're claiming that it provides, right? We're not, it's, it's sort of like if I'm studying piano with a teacher, uh, I want to take a look at, so how am I doing, right? Uh, how mm -hmm. does this sound? I want to be able to record myself and compare that the way I sound to six months ago. And I, I would like to hear an improvement, not a, not a decline. Um, and some people embrace this kind of approach and some people really reject it. Some people are not interested. They just want to have the kind of, the, the experiential part of what the class or the lesson provides. And they, they, they're not trying to use the teacher in that particular way. And that's totally fine. That's, that's, that's a personal, that's a personal choice. But after 20 years of teaching, I'm, I'm just a little more, I'm more willing to talk about um, what, you know, what directions you can clearly go in with the work. Is it really possible? That, I mean, one of the claims that I think Feldenkrais teachers sometimes make or Feldenkrais himself talked about was that it's not just that you're going to, you know, get rid of the pain or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, everybody wants pain to, to go away. Yeah. But that the way that the pain is going to go away is through you actually learning how to function better. <sighs> yeah, in other words, you know, your shoulder, it, it feels horrible and, it, and it's just stiff all the time. And when you play your violin, it feels worse every time you play it and then you rest it and then you pick it up and it feels worse. And you're just in this cycle of, Okay, so what's going on there, right? Well, yeah. there's probably something you don't understand. There's probably something that your violin teacher didn't understand. There's probably something that maybe even the other people who gave you advice about it didn't understand. You are going to have to learn what you don't know. And Sounds maybe like what... responsibility. Take Absolutely. Responsibility for yourself. Again, if you want it. It's, yeah, sure, it's of there. course. It, with, a, with, the right kind of teacher, <laughs> with the right kind of teacher at the, at the pace that, you know, obviously makes sense for you and whatever. But if you want it, that's there. And, and I would encourage somebody that, that understands that or, or values that. That's, that's there for you. You, yes, it, it maybe let's say not in this lesson or maybe not even the next mm -hmm. three lessons, but in six months, you, you should understand the ways in which a human shoulder is designed to move and the mm -hmm. ways in which you were moving it, which probably run in conflict with each other. And, and that's not to say you have to become a surgeon or a, a physical therapist or anything, but that information, first of all, is out there. It's out there in the world in a way that it has never been before. You can go to YouTube and you can learn all the muscles of the shoulder in a weekend. You know, it, maybe you won't integrate that information well, but you can begin to just see what is it made of, what are the different kinds of patterns that a shoulder makes? And then you can start to compare because of this wonderful practice of awareness through movement. You're not just academically acquiring that information and then, well, what do I do with all the names of the muscles? No, you have a practice now where you can actually apply some of this knowledge and actually come at it both from the learning from the top down, like, oh, there are three mm -hmm. muscles that do this and you, know, you can do that. But you also have a, 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 um, a um, uh, inductive practice where you can really start with where you are and gradually start to scale up your abilities using mm. awareness and movement. Now that's a, that's fairly rigorous. That's not for every, that's not for the average person maybe, but it's, it's with the right teacher, it's certainly available. And the thing you want to think about is what do I actually want? What do I actually want? I mean, here's an example. Would you like mm -hmm. to still be dealing with this shoulder pain five years from now? Now, most people, if they're asked, they're going to go five years. Are you kidding? No, I don't. Okay. Yeah. How about two years, right? Like now, obviously there's some length of time that's too short, like claiming that by tomorrow we're going to, you know, build you a new functional understanding. <laughs> that's maybe too short. But the question is to become more realistic 
and more grounded in what you're actually doing. What are there? There is, in a sense, an achievement you really are trying to get to, which is yeah. I want to be able to bring the violin up and and feel nothing. I want to feel an absence of any of this crazy work I always experience when I first bring up the instrument in the orchestra every time the conductor's the conductor says ready and I go, uh, uh, you know, like that there are people having this kind of experience and it's important at some point to really sort of interrogate that and say like, well, what are you going to do about it? Because clearly in a year from now, you want that to be in your rear view mirror, right? And the yes. way you get there is by learning to function more clearly. And you learn to function more clearly by understanding what movement is actually comprised of, what in your experience is really useful, what in your experience is actually reliably cruddy, terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an important, that's a, and it sounds like who would want to do that? Let me tell you, to, to, to find the blind spots or the, the clogs in the way that your spine moves or doesn't move, those are important days. Those are really important days. And it can oh, become yeah. part of how you transform as a person over time. You transform into a person that, again, doesn't have this problem, can play the repertoire that they want to play without mm -hmm. killing themselves in the process, right? Nobody who gets injured says, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna work really hard on the Beethoven concerto but I'm gonna kill myself in the process. I'm gonna I'm gonna cripple my hands and make my back, you know, a, a source of pain. No, nobody sets out with that objective. No, everybody thinks, oh, it's not gonna happen to me. <laughs> right. And the and this the sad <laughs> confrontation. I mean, this is this is both for the people in the performing arts, but it's really for the average person too. The experience that so many of us have is that we we're no longer able to trust our own experience of our bodies and movement. That's what that's what uh, dysfunction really feels like. It, I, I put my weight on my hip and my hip just grabs every time and I have this annoying pain everywhere I go. It's as if I can no longer trust that hip that I used to be able to run on and whatever. And so the question is, what am I going to do about it now? Well, what you're gonna have to do is learn that there's more than one way to do it. There's certainly more than the way that you may be doing it now habitually. And you have to be willing to engage in learning, right? Yes. Now you might want to get a massage and that might feel lovely, but the question is, what did you learn? What, what, it, what new <laughs> understanding do you have? Is it specific or is it really general? Well, I learned that a massage feels great. Well, bravo, you and 50 million other people now have the same experience. <laughs> massage feels great. What, what can you apply as you climb the stairs? Because you're still climbing the stairs with this awful limp and you're, you're shifting the weight way off the hip or too much on the, ha, did, did that, did you, did you learn anything from this massage experience? And in that way, it can really be about a person trying to apply their understanding to what they do and just creating uh, a different animal, basically. You really, you want to create a different animal with your body because it's capable of learning a lot of nuance and refinement mm. that yes, maybe the first half of your life did not contain that stuff or you didn't have the opportunity or you were just unlucky. Okay, but what about now, right? Right, and it doesn't have to be fast. You can just no. do a little bit and continue doing a little bit and a little bit and a little it bit. It does not need to be fast at all. It's, it's yeah. usually useful if it's consistent. Right. It, it can be uh, sometimes moving super slow is absolutely just so useful for the person to do because it's it reveals so much more information than they usually get from just them, their typical way of moving around. But it, it's also useful if the practice is consistent because yes. the consistency of the practice is it also allows you to build a different vocabulary with yourself. And you really are trying to build a different vocabulary than you've had. It's the same body. It's like it's like if I tried to learn Italian, right? Like I tried to learn a little Italian when I went to Italy, right? Mm -hmm. But you have to do that every day. You, it's not enough yeah. to buy a book on learning Italian or to no. read the book. You have to not just practice, you also have to talk to other people who speak Italian. You have to risk a little bit. Uh, saying, mispronouncing words and having people correct you. You have to be an infant as an as Italian speaker for a while, and you have to suffer yeah. through 
those stages of development because that's what they are. They're really stages of development. And but it's an once you realize that that's what you're doing, once you get over the fact of like, oh, my gosh, I'm not going to be cured in five weeks. Like you, you just you just get rid of that little that little wish that you have. We all mm -hmm. have that wish. Once you get rid of that, it's actually quite fun to embrace the challenges of learning. And especially yes. if you meet the right teacher or you find yourself in a really mm -hmm. good context for it, man, that's one of the joys of life, actually. E Stop even if it does involve your, your, your damn shoulder injury that you, that can really be one of the joys of actually creating something very different. And I mean, I've, I've torn this shoulder more than once, not completely, but definitely in a, a couple of bad falls. And I couldn't lift my hand to touch my belly button for, for two weeks. Wow. And now, you know, I can, I can press a great, a great amount of weight over my head. It's, it's better than it was even before I injured it. Wow. That's yeah. promising. It's very promising. It's extremely hopeful. The, the, the method yes. really, I mean, it, it takes work. It takes, like I said, consistency, but again, you're learning to really mine. There is this potential in here that is, you don't know much about it. You, you really mm. don't know much about it. And the point is to start to know something about it so that you can level up your, the quality of your life. How much do you want to level it up? Well, soon you discover, well, that's going to be up to you, actually. There probably yes. are limits. Like for me, I don't want to run a marathon. I'm just, <laughs> it doesn't interest me. It's just physically, I just, ugh, it, it, I don't want to spend my time that way. Could I do it? I guess, but I already am so psychologically like, ugh. there are other heights I would like to achieve, but marathon, not for me. So there's, there's, a, there's a limit already for me in one particular direction. But in other yes. directions, there, there's there's a quite a nice horizon I can see for myself way out there, and it's just there's just an amount of of work and practice between here and there. Well, Andrew, I think we've reached the hour. Okay. Um, do you want to tell the audience how they can maybe work with you or like get to know more about you? If sure. They found this sure. talk interesting. My website is bodyofknowledge.me. Dot me and i run an online course it's a subscription course there are different tiers of uh, of pricing um the the course contains many different awareness through movement lessons and they're all organized into particular sets they're organized as series and most of them were taken from live lessons that i taught in classes that i taught as a series so for instance there's a group called the shoulder program And that's mm -hmm. about 15 or 18 lessons that are that are that were taught in sequence to a group of students to take them gradually through some very foundational material and understanding of the shoulder. But it's all these awareness through movement lessons. Um, and there are over 400 lessons in the in the library right now. So you it's can you can it's a lot. I, I admittedly nobody says I wonder if I, I'd love to do 400 lessons. That's, <laughs> that's not necessarily the way to think about it. The way to think about it is when you come in, anybody at any tier can join one of the, pri the, the public classes that I teach uh, online. Um, mm -hmm. But the different, the different pricing tiers just give you access to the different, uh, different amounts of the library. Um, and I really built it this way because over the years in private practice, I saw that the people that really progress smoother, stronger, in the direction that they want to go are the people that develop a practice with this material. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted to create a library where a person could do that, a person that's, that really sees the potential in themselves and in, this, and in this practice can really move in that direction. There are people in the, in the course now that are doing lessons every day, every morning they nice. get up and do a lesson. I like to see that. You know, that's, to me, that's really a person that's embracing their, their path. So, yeah. Awesome. awesome. The link will be in the description down below. And I can personally say that your lessons are great. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks. Yes. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for the conversation, Leah.